Greetings, everyone. This is uh, Mark Knoyer from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm going to be presenting a short presentation on textiles of the Indus civilization with a special focus on cotton before we begin our question and answer period. I want to especially thank the uh, Royal Ontario Museum and uh, curators uh, Sarah Fee and Deb Metzger for inviting me to present this talk. I also want to thank the Department of Archaeology and Museums, Government of Pakistan, and the Archaeological Survey of India for allowing me to work on the Indus sites in their countries. I also want to especially thank the Harappa Archaeological Research Project team for many years of hard work at the site and my numerous colleagues and students for sharing their data and knowledge. Today we're going to start with just a brief overview of the Indus civilization. Uh, in the civilization is a region it, it developed in a region which is now Pakistan and Western India, but it's surrounded by other important cultural developments in the areas of Rajasthan and the Deccan region of central, uh, central and Peninsular India, the Ganga of India, as well as Baluchistan, Afghanistan, and Central Asia, and also even Oman. Uh, the time period for the development of urbanism is around 2600 BC. The red lines here are where we see it in Mesopotamia and in Egypt and in China. But as you can see, the early developments of food production, which is the domestication of plants and animals, goes quite early. In the Indus Valley, it's as early as 7,000. And by 5,500, we begin to see pottery being made and eventually regional cultures developing. So I use a framework of early food producing era, meaning the earliest period of time when the Neolithic is usually called the Neolithic in other regions of the world. Now, regionalization era for a period when we have other cultural developments occurring and technologies, and integration as a period of urbanism. So these are the main three periods that I'll be talking about. The study of Indus textiles began with the very earliest excavations. And this, these were uh, started around 1930s. And it continues to improve with new scientific approaches. This is an example of one of the earliest discoveries of textiles from the site of Mohenjo-daro. So Mohenjo-daro's uh, urban phase dates from about 2600 to 1900 BC. This silver jar had a traces of fiber on the lid, which allowed people to figure out the amount of uh, weave, the size of the weave, and then at that time they thought they were able to identify red matter as a possible dye for this textile. Other fabrics were found as well, but they weren't identified in terms of whether they were cotton or not. But this textile was called, was referred to as cotton. And this cotton would have been Gossypium arboreum, which is a variety that we think has been domesticated in South Asia. So back in the 1930s, they, they found the first evidence of cotton, but it wasn't until the 70s when the French archaeological mission began excavating at the site of Mehrgar which is in the borders of Baluchistan and the Indus Valley, at the base of a pass, that they found other evidence of, of cotton and the earliest evidence of cotton in the subcontinent. So the excavations at Mehrgar, run by Jean-François Jarige from the Musée Guimet, um, they, and Catherine, his wife, and a really wonderful archaeological team, excavated the Neolithic burials. And in these burials, they found evidence for basketry, as well as many bone tools associated with weaving and ornaments, which would have been threaded by fine fibers, which unfortunately were not preserved. But in one of the burials, they were able to find evidence of textiles. And this textile was colored. You can just barely see it here in, this, in the, in the um, sediment. Uh, Catherine Jarige and uh, Aurore Didier from the Musée Guimet just sent this to me last night. So I was able to provide it to you today. So I really want to thank them for sending me this image. But this is the earliest textile preserved in the Indus Valley. And it has a reddish color, you can see. And there are traces of black, which might have been an, an organic dye, either indigo or madder. This burial dates to, in the, it's in the upper layers, probably 1B, so around 6,000 to maybe 6,000 BC. But even earlier, and we don't know the fiber, what, what fiber this was. It's just a very, very faint uh, impression here in the, in the clay. Um, but another discovery from a burial which dates to around 7,000 BC um, are copper beads. 
that when they were examined more closely, they realized that there was a something in the middle of them. And by polishing this and looking at it in uh, under the microscope, they could identify fibers. And the fibers, when you cut a cross section of the fibers, they could identify these fibers as cotton. And it was probably wild cotton because some of the fibers appear to be um, not necessarily completely mature. So they may have been partly uh, undeveloped. But this fiber would have been collected from wild cotton plants growing in the area and then twisted and made into a thread that was used to thread these copper beads. This is the oldest evidence of cotton in the subcontinent and in the world. Um, we have later developments in the region, so Mehargar and a, a nearby site called Nausharosh has many figurines where we see people wearing what are clearly textiles and or um, fibers, ha turbans, uh, sh sashes, necklaces that would have been threaded, possible headdresses made of textiles. And we see turbans on figurines of men with patterns on them, which would have been woven different colors of uh, fibers. Today in Pakistan, the Afghan men wear silk turbans made in multan with uh, silver wire in them or silver, silver threads. And this is an example of silver and silk and cotton mixed from, the, from, from uh, Sindh. Uh, we also have pottery from Mehargar and uh, associated sites that are highly decorated with geometric designs. And I argue that these designs were probably also been reflected in embroideries and patterns on textiles. We don't have any of those preserved, but it makes sense that they would have, if they can paint pottery this way, they could have decorated uh, fibers and ceramic uh, uh, textiles as well. We also have figurines from the site of Nausharo, which is slightly later, about 20, uh, 3800 to 2200 BC, where we have people wearing pantaloons, and which would have been sewn, so they would have been using needles and thread to uh, fashion these, and then elaborate headdresses as well, slightly different from the earlier period. Uh, similar types of pants or pantaloons would have been are worn today among the communities living in the same region. And we can see a very long continuity in some of the textile traditions of Western of this part of Pakistan. Uh, other figurines show elaborate designs on the legs, and I like to think of these as again pattern textiles. And this technique called susi, which is a combination of silver and silk and cotton with different colors, is still very popular among um, the communities in Sindh. And they're used especially for leggings and um, tight churidar pajamas, which are worn by women. We see similar patterns on the pottery as well. So the cotton that we're talking about would have been Gossypium arboreum. It's first documented and probably domesticated in, the, in this region. Eventually it was traded to the west and the east. There's another species called Herbaceum, Gossypium herbaceum, and the only wild variety of this species has been and found in southern Africa. So botanists argue that possibly it came from Africa and spread north. We know that it was found in Sudan, in Arabia, it, but it's also found in western India and west Asia. And I'm not going to go into the botanical arguments about whether these are two species or one species. Most people agree that they are two separate species that became domesticated separately. Um, we have evidence of charred cotton seeds from the site of Mehargar dating to around 5000 BC. So the fiber is dating to around 7000, but charred seeds are dating to around 5000. And I'm putting this map up here just so you can see that the development of cotton in the Indus Valley was also linked to many trade networks. So people at Mehargar were getting turquoise from Iran. Lapis from Central Asia, these are 800 to 1,000 or 1,200 kilometers away. They were getting shell from the coast of Oman. They were getting carnelian from the Gujarat region and the, probably other things from the Indus Valley um, itself. So if we have Gossypium species at Mehargar at 7,000, we know that we have also Gossypium at Balakot, which is a Harappan site dating to around 2,500, and there's evidence that it was probably cultivated in this region at that time. We have evidence of Gossypium at Harappa, both in seed forms and in woven fiber forms. We also have possible Indigofera, which is a dye uh, for, for indigo, 
at the site of Harappa, and we definitely have it at the site of Rojdi, which is a site in central Gujarat. So this Indus region has clear evidence for the earliest development of gossypium and its use in textiles and in fibers, and probably also dyeing. I don't know where exactly matter comes from, but it would have been found in peninsular India as well as in the northern regions. So that would have also been present at many sites. The trade was going across the sea to Oman, and we have, I'll be showing you evidence for cotton in the site of Ras al Had in Oman. And shell from the Indus Valley was going to Oman, and Oman from Oman to the Indus probably. And copper was also going back and forth. And then shell from the Indus was also going very early to as far as Mesopotamia. So if shell was going to Mesopotamia, then it's possible that cotton was also going. We also have movement the other direction. We know that African millets and sorghum were coming from Africa and eventually spread into Gujarat by around 2500 BC. Now, African herbaceum may have also come at the same time, and that's maybe why we find it around the coast of Baluchistan, where it grows very well. But there's also a wild species, Gossypium stoxi, which is a wild cotton that is also found commonly along the coastal regions. So there's still a lot of mystery about which is what species is going where, but there's clearly interaction across this region, and cotton is centered in this part of the world to start with. Um, the Indus Valley traded in Mesopotamia, and we know that Mesopotamian cities were getting beads and um, other commodities, wood and animals and exotic species from, from the Indus Valley. Indus people were also trading with Central Asia, possibly and definitely Oman, and possibly even into Western, what is now Western China, Xinjiang, and the northern regions of Central Asia. So when we look at the major types of textiles, the Indus has cotton, we also have wool, we have jute and hemp, we have palm and linen and silk. Uh, Arabia, we have evidence for primarily linen and wool, but also palm and jute and hemp. And then recently I've discovered cotton at the site of Ras al Hat. Uh, whether or not Mesopotamia had cotton is problematic because we don't have any textual evidence for it until around 700 to 681 BC when Sennacherib, the Assyrian king, claims to have cultivated it in his temple in Nineveh. Um, the Akkadian word that develops for cotton is kidinu, um, though later on they use karpasa, which is the, a Sanskrit word for, for, for um, cotton. Uh, herbaceum, which requires a drier habitat, is thought to have spread from Arabia or North Africa into India and then up through Central Asia and across the north into northern China. Arboreum requires a lot a, a moisture climate. It would have spread throughout South Asia to south, south, southern India and then to eastern India and what is now Bangladesh and um, uh, Assam and then into Southeast Asia and then southern China from, from that region. Cotton is recorded in China by as, as early as 200 BC, or possibly even earlier, and it's called by a name that comes from the Sanskrit, pat, pata, which is the Sanskrit word, but in patie or tiepu, uh, which is the Chinese version of that word. So coming back to the Indus civilization, we can see the, how the development of this textile begins, uh, starting in Mehargar, but the actual growth of cotton you have to have large fields to, su to support an industry. Uh, Mahagar is a very small area, it's, and it's located on a pass. It's very good for trade. But Harappa is in the center of one of the biggest cotton-producing regions of Pakistan today. And it probably was also in the past. And Harappa is, the, is a, a settlement that started as a small village at around 3700 BC, but then grew into one of the largest cities of the Indus civilization. It has two phases in the early period, the Ravi phase and the Kot Diji phase, and we see the developments of, of writing and seals and um, weights, which indicate control of commodities, and also some figurines that have woven patterns on them that appear to be a woven textile. From the Ravi phase, the earliest phase at Harappa, we have clear evidence for weaving tools. These are bone spatula and um, that would have been highly polished that would have been used for weaving. We have lots of spindle whorls that come in two categories of weights. 
16.6 grams and 28.4 grams, which suggests that they were spinning different thicknesses of fiber. We also have microbeads made of tiny pieces of steatite, a soapstone that's been uh, ground and shaped and then fired. And these have very tiny holes that are just barely big enough to hold a hand-spun cotton fiber. So this is uh, the brown cotton, a variety of native cotton in Pakistan. And it can just barely fit through these holes of these early beads. Uh, later beads um, are, are much, much finer than this, and they would have required silk. We have um, beads with fiber impressions. Uh, we can't determine what type of fiber it was, maybe wool or maybe cotton, but clearly evidence for weaving at this time period. By the Cote DG phase, we have um, uh, clear evidence of woven uh, textiles that have multiple colors. And this skirt that the woman is wearing reminds me of the traditional checked or plaid skirts that are being made in Pakistan today called kes. And kes is woven with hand-spun cotton and indigo dyed or madder or katechu, uh, which is from the acacia tree, which is a brown color. During the Kodiji phase, we see more, about four different varieties of spindle whorls which indicate that they're spinning a larger array of, uh, of th fiber thicknesses. Uh, and it's also suggests that a more complex textile industry is developing. Now, jumping forward to the Indus cities from the, so we have a, a foundation where textiles are developing, but Indus cities then become the centers for which I think textile production becomes very critical. And textile production is one way of increasing economic wealth and power. And these major cities that we see developing are also located in areas that have good agricultural land and the potential for uh, cotton development. I would argue that cotton is one of the main fibers that would have been contributing to the, the growth of Indian cities or Indus cities, and that they um, would have been using this as an important economic uh, uh, um, support. During the Harappan period, we have figurines with lots of different styles of uh, textiles on them. The short skirt is the most common, but we have different headdresses, all made with woven textiles. In the Indus cities, Harappa is one of the largest in the north, in the Punjab. Mohenjo-daro is located in Sindh. Dhola Vira is located on an island in Kutch, which controls all the trade of the region of Gujarat. And Gujarat is an important cotton-producing region. So is Sindh, and so is the region of the Punjab. These cities were massive with mud brick and fired brick architecture with massive city walls to control trade. They had uh, monumental buildings. They had writing that we can't read yet, uh, and seals that were used by elites to control economic and ritual uh, ideology. The city of Harappa, where I've worked since 1986, is a multiple walled city. So each area of the city had a separate wall around it, numerous gateways, caravanserais outside, and cemeteries to the south and west of the settlement. Uh, this city was also one of the most um, uh, expansive. It grew, in, grew, grew gradually from a small settlement to multiple walled settlements over the, its history. Uh, Dolavira is ex an example of a, a, a three-walled city, which clearly is located, created for defense on an island, but there's no evidence that it was ever attacked. But it would have controlled all of the trade from Gujarat along the coast and through these inland uh, waterways to the main Indus Valley. There are smaller settlements that are located around Dolavira, so the site of Goladoro and Shikarpur, which are located here, and then Rojdi, which I mentioned earlier, is right in the middle of, of Saurashtra. Figurines from the Indus civilization show, uh, and these are from Harappa, show a, a wide range of textiles. And I mentioned earlier the skirts, the headdresses, and then some skirts are longer than others. And just because these figurines look like they are nude, it doesn't mean that they are. Because I, I think that they were probably covered with textiles and decorated just as many uh, dolls today are covered with textiles. We have other figurines which have longer skirts and some of them are highly patterned. Uh, this may represent tiger skin, but it also could represent 
woven colored patterns in the in the textile. And one of the most dis important discoveries of the Indus is a figure figure of carved uh, steatite, which is referred to as the priest king. When it was first discovered, uh, we only have black and white photos. There was evidence of reddish color inside the trefoil designs and a kind of darker color around and the outside. And I think of this as being possibly indigo or um, green color. Uh, and then the red would have been um, ochre and it's been analyzed. And then this probably was all painted. So it shows a cloak and it's not a repeating pattern. So it's not block prints, but it would have probably been applique or painted design like Kalamkari on this textile. And we have bangles with a similar design. This is a greenish color and a red fill and then a white design on it. So this is from a, a bangle from Harappa. We also have figures of men with long cloaks and figurines of men with turbans. So textiles were important for both men and for women, an important com 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 component of this urban society. At the site of Harappa, uh, I was able to excavate an area that had been referred to before as a grain producing region or area of the city. Uh, this was excavated by Sir Mortimer Wheeler. I went back and I rechecked his excavation, which he had filled up very badly. And I realized that he missed the fact that this circular platform is actually inside of a room. You do not grind grain or thresh grain inside of a closed room because you would die of silicosis. Grain is threshed in the outside regions of the fields where there's wind and it clear, you know, it it's allows you to breathe uh, effectively. These circular platforms were all located in closed rooms. And in the analysis of this, I found that inside the center part of each platform, there was a dark stained green level, which I think may relate to a process of fermentation of indigo uh, that would have resulted in indigo concentration in the center. And then they removed that for making dyes. So this area had 22 platforms of circular platforms that might have been used for preparation of indigo. Today, indigo in South Asia is done with a colonial method that was introduced by the British, where all you do is you throw the indigo plant in a pit, thresh it for a couple hours, take the plant and throw it away. This is a very inefficient way and does not remove all the indigo from the leaves. It's quick though, and you get very high quality indigo. But in Japan, where you ferment the leaves over a three month period, you get much higher percentage of indigo per weight of plants. So I think the Indus technique may have been similar to what is happening in what's done traditionally in Japan and not this colonial method that is seen today in South Asia. Circular platforms are located over here and near it is a large building which has multiple long parallel rooms which people have you know, thought it might be a granary I was able to excavate a corner here, and there's no evidence of grain storage. There's no evidence of actually people living in these. They're very clean, and these rooms um, do not have the kind of domestic debris that is associated with housing. Um, a visitor from a nearby textile mill came and said, wow, this looks like our textile factory. And that brought to my mind the possibility that this may be a textile um, warehouse. A uh, place to keep textiles clean, uh, no food items around, nothing for the rats to come and chew on, and that these buildings may have been long rooms for uh, patterning, uh, um, making designs on the textiles or drying them, and that this may have in fact been an important textile structure. There are three phases of this building. So this is the middle phase, this is the last phase, and underneath it is the first phase. So it was rebuilt three times. During the Harappa period, we also see a disappearance of spindle whorls. There are a few, but not very many. But, but we do see lots of copper rods, and a copper rod is the only thing that would remain from a spinning wheel. So I think that during the Harappan period, they changed the technology of preparation of fibers, and we have rods that were used on spinning wheels. Some of these rods actually have fibers attached to them still. And in the past, people have thought of these as being, you know, applicators for surma or coal on the eyes, but actually I think they probably are with, associated with spinning wheels. And when you have a spinning wheel, you can make much more uniform and regular thickness of fiber. 
And this is an impression of a textile on a toy bed, which shows really uniform textile fibers on the surface, which have no knots in it, like you would see from hand spinning. So this, to me, is, a, 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 again, evidence for the use of spinning wheel. Um, I've been examining the textiles from uh, uh, under the SEM, and we can see uh, the differences in cotton versus silk versus jute versus wool, and uh, the types of fibers that we see preserved on copper. This is examples of cotton fiber woven at, from Harappa. We have the uh, SEM images of cotton fibers. We have impressions of cotton fibers on clay, so then I take an impression of the uh, impression and then look at it under the SEM. And then I've done experimental work taking different types of cotton, hand-spun cotton, and showing the different patterns that you would get on clay. Uh, and most recently, from the coastal site of Oman, we have examples of cotton um, on fish hooks and inside of a bead. This is a cotton fiber on the inside of a steatite bead, and you can clearly see the shape of the cotton uh, fiber itself. And then this is probably mercerized cotton because it's very um, kind of smushed out. And this is on a uh, fish hook. And I've measured them and they, and they have the structure and the shape and the size that is com comparable to cotton itself. So I want to conclude that South Asia has been an important region for the development of cotton and it has continued to be an important emporium for the production of trade commodities and a crossroads between East Asia, West Asia, and Africa. And this exhibition that you've seen or have a chance to look at uh, in the catalog um, follows with the later history. And I hope that this period of the earlier history helps to fill in some of the gaps in our knowledge. Thank you very much.